Hello, and welcome to the channel. For those of us who are old enough to remember the words of WWE Hall of Famer Hulk Hogan, say your prayers, take your vitamins, and you will never go wrong, would understandably think this was sound advice. But if the person giving you your vitamins was this woman, you might want to take a moment to reconsider. This is the story of the Black Widow, Judy Buenoano. But before I begin, Please like the video and leave a comment sharing your thoughts about this case. If you're new here, subscribe to the channel and turn on all notifications to stay updated whenever I upload a new video. Thank you, and let's begin. Today's story begins on the 4th of April 1943, where in Kwana, Texas, Bueno Año would be born Judias Welty. Judias' upbringing was sadly one which was troubled. Her mother had sadly died of tuberculosis when Judias was barely two years old. After her mother's death, Judias' father would send both Judy and her baby brother Robert to live with their grandparents, while her two older siblings were placed up for adoption. She would live with her grandparents from 1945 up until 1955, when her father remarried and took Judias, now 12 years old, to Roswell, New Mexico, to live with him and her new stepmother and two stepbrothers. Unfortunately for Judias, this move would be far from a positive experience for her. She would claim to be subjected to regular beatings, starved, burned with cigarettes, and she said that she was forced to work slave hours around the family home. After being tormented by her father and stepmother for about two years, she would finally snap. In 1957, Judias flew into a rage. She would pour hot grease onto her stepbrothers, scalding them, before turning her attention to her stepmother and father, attacking them with household objects, as well as punching and kicking them repeatedly. This outburst saw Judias being arrested, and she was sentenced to 60 days in jail. However, she refused the opportunity to return to the family home, instead telling a judge that she wished to be released into a reform school. This was granted, and she was placed into Foothills High, a juvenile detention centre where she would graduate from in 1959. By the time of her graduation, Judias had fully estranged herself from her family. She had reportedly said of her younger brother Robert that, quote, I wouldn't spit down his throat if his guts were on fire. By 1960, Judias, now living under the pseudonym Anna Schultz, was working as a nurse's aide. But at just 17 years of age, she had fallen pregnant. Rumours swirled that the father was a pilot from an air force base nearby, but she never confirmed nor denied this. Michael Schultz would be born on the 30th of March 1961, and not long after the birth of her son, Anna would meet Air Force Sergeant James Goodyear and enter a whirlwind romance, culminating in their marriage on the 21st of November 1962. Now going by the name Judias Goodyear, she would give birth to her second child, James Goodyear Jr., in 1966. To celebrate the birth, James Sr. officially adopted Michael. The following year, James Sr. and Judias would have a daughter, Kimberly. By 1968, the family had moved to Orlando, Florida. Judias became a business owner for the first time, opening Conway's Acres Childcare Center. She would list James Sr. as a co-owner, but he was still a serving officer with the United States Air Force and was scheduled to commence a tour of Vietnam. After completing this tour, James Sr. returned to his family, but barely three months later, he would fall sick and be admitted to the US Naval Hospital in Orlando. He was suffering from symptoms which doctors struggled to diagnose. This came as a surprise, as James was in good health and showed no signs of illness prior to his sudden decline. Before they were able to determine the cause of James's illness, he tragically passed away on the 15th of September 1971. It would later be determined that his passing was a result of natural causes. Just five days after he died, Judias Goodyear cashed in a life insurance policy worth around $28,000 as well as receiving approximately $64,000 in Veterans Administration benefits. The family's poor luck continued. 
Towards the end of 1971, a fire had broken out in their Orlando home, which was ruled accidental. Jadias would collect a further $90,000 in fire insurance payments. In 1972, Jadias uprooted the family and moved to Pensacola, Florida. It was here that Jadias met another man, Bobby Joe Morris, and she would strike up a relationship with him in 1973. During this time, her eldest son Michael had become something of an issue for Jadias. He was often misbehaving in school and academically he was performing poorly. It was said that he would score in the dull to normal range on IQ tests at that time. Wanting to seek treatment for Michael, Jadias would try to place her son in a residential facility which was reserved specifically for military dependents. But because of the death of James Goodyear Sr., this option was no longer available. Instead, she would arrange for a state hospital to examine Michael in 1974. Jadias would eventually place Michael in foster care while he sought psychiatric treatment. Then in 1977, Bobby Morris would move to Trinidad, Colorado, inviting Jadias, who was now going by the name Judy Morris, and her children along with him. She would agree to the proposal, taking Michael out of the foster care system in the process, but not before collecting another insurance payout after her second Pensacola home had mysteriously caught fire. For a short time, everything appeared to be going well for the Morrises. That was until the 4th of January 1978, when Bobby suddenly fell ill and was rushed to San Rafael Hospital. As with James Goodyear, doctors were unable to determine the exact cause of Bobby's condition. But unlike James, Bobby didn't die. He would stay in hospital for three weeks until the 21st of January 1978, when he was discharged from the hospital and placed into Judy's care. Sadly, his time out of hospital was short-lived. Just two days after being discharged, Bobby collapsed while at the dinner table and was rushed back to hospital. This time, he wouldn't leave alive. On the 28th of January 1978, Bobby Joe Morris passed away from what doctors would later rule as a result of cardiac arrest and metabolic acidosis. Despite not being married, Judy was seen as Bobby's common-law wife and as such, she was able to successfully claim three life insurance policies in Bobby's name in early February that same year. Naturally, once Bobby's family learned of his death and subsequent payout, alarm bells began to ring, but there was nothing they could do to prove any foul play. While they suspected that Bobby wasn't the first victim of Judy's, one thing was for certain. She wasn't his last. On the 3rd of May 1978, Judy would legally change the name of hers and her children's surname to Buena Año, a loosely Spanish translation of her first husband's surname, Goodyear. A month later, the family were back in Pensacola. Judy would continue to struggle with Michael academically, resulting in him dropping out of high school in his sophomore year. In June 1979, Michael Buenoano would follow in his adoptive father's footsteps and join the army. After successfully completing his basic training, he would be assigned at Fort Benning. Before his arrival on the 6th of November 1979, he stopped by his mother's home in Florida to pay her a visit. By the time he arrived at Fort Benning, it was immediately apparent that something wasn't right with Michael. His health began to deteriorate rapidly and he was taken to army physicians to figure out what was happening to him. They were able to identify that Michael was exhibiting signs of base metal poisoning and after carrying out further tests, they found around seven times the normal levels of arsenic in his system. Sadly, it was too late to reverse the damage that had already been done to his body, but over the next six weeks, he would be cared for by medical staff at the facility. During this time, the muscles in his arms and legs would atrophy to the point where Michael required braces on his legs and a prosthetic device on one of his arms. The equipment weighed approximately 60 pounds and was a heavy burden on the young man, who could no longer walk or use his hands. Sadly, Michael's ambitions of serving his country were cut short and he was discharged from the army. Less than a year later, on the 13th of May 1980, Judy would take Michael and James Jr. out canoeing on the East River near Milton, Florida. Shortly into the boat ride, however, trouble would occur when the canoe suddenly capsized. 
While Judy and her younger son James were able to successfully escape the vessel and make it to shore, Michael was not so fortunate. Because of his poor health and the fact that he was wearing the metal braces, Michael would tragically sink to the bottom of the river, drowning. Judy would explain the series of events to local authorities, who would eventually come to accept her story. However, a separate army investigation would persist after they launched their own search for evidence on the 27th of May 1980. But by mid-September, it appeared as though they too accepted Judy's version of events, with Judy receiving $20,000 from a military life insurance policy held under Michael's name. Following the death of her son, Judy Buenoano would set up a beauty parlor in Gulf Breeze, Florida, and in February 1981, she struck up a new relationship with Pensacola businessman John Gentry. She would move in with Gentry six months later. John would later say upon seeing Judy for the first time at a mud wrestling match, quote, Judy was standing at the bar, all dressed in black. She wore black quite a lot. In fact, psychologically, I think that says a lot about her. Judy would tell John that she spent time at a nursing school, obtained a PhD in biochemistry, as well as a PhD in psychology from the University of Alabama. She had also told him that she had recently completed a tour of duty as the head of nursing at West Florida Hospital. It was absolute rubbish, but she did this to impress John, which he took completely at face value. Judy's relationship with John would see her live a lavish life. She would be showered with expensive gifts, treated to Caribbean cruises, and even indulged in imported champagne. It was certainly a life that anyone in Judy's position would love to have, but for a woman like Judy, this wasn't enough. In October 1982, Judy convinced John to purchase life insurances for one another. They initially set up $50,000 policies each, but unbeknownst to John, Judy had secretly increased the policy on John to $500,000, paying the additional premiums out of her own pocket to ensure that John remained unaware. Not long after, Judy had suddenly become concerned for John's health and well-being. Concerned he wasn't getting his daily supplement of vitamins, she convinced him to start taking vitamin capsules, which of course Judy provided. By December, John's health was significantly worse. He was regularly vomiting and experiencing dizzy spells. Despite this, he continued to take the vitamins, but by the 16th of December, he would be hospitalized as a result. While he was in hospital, John had stopped taking the vitamin capsules, and over his 12-day stay, his condition dramatically improved. Even though we can look back at this now and connect the dots, it seemed as though John failed to link his sickness with the vitamins. After he was discharged from hospital, he returned to duty and the relationship resumed as normal. For a time, nothing of note occurred, John did not appear to suffer a reoccurrence of his previous ailments, and by June 1983, Judy had exciting news for her partner. She was pregnant with his child. On the 25th of June 1983, the couple were attending a dinner party together at Driftwood Restaurant. Looking to celebrate Judy's pregnancy privately, John slipped out of the party early to purchase champagne for just the two of them. He hopped into his car, preparing himself for the drive to the liquor store, but upon turning the ignition key, his car exploded. Somehow, John was still alive, but severely injured. He would be rushed to hospital where trauma surgeons would work tirelessly, successfully saving his life in the process. After learning what had taken place, police began to investigate the cause of the explosion. It didn't take forensic analysts long to figure out that it was in fact a car bomb which was responsible. At this point, investigators turned their attention to Judy and began to look at her more closely, and it was here that her web of lies began to unfold. Detectives quickly learned of the lies which Judy had told John Gentry at the start of their relationship, immediately throwing her credibility into doubt. Conversations with Judy's friends revealed that as far back as November 1982, Judy had claimed to friends that John was suffering with a terminal illness. In truth, this was not the case. Detectives also discovered that she had booked tickets for a world cruise for her and her children, but not John. But perhaps the saddest and most vindictive lie Judy told was the one about her being pregnant. It was impossible, as in 1975, Judy underwent a sterilization procedure, rendering her infertile. 
On the 29th of June 1983, four days after the failed attempt on John Gentry's life, police were able to speak with John. Revealing to him what they had learned about his partner was undoubtedly a shocking experience for John, but it was enough to convince him that Judy was not the woman he thought she was. Remembering the vitamin capsules Judy had encouraged him to take back in 1982, he was still in possession of some of these and handed them to detectives for further testing. Analysis of the pills revealed the presence of paraformaldehyde. The chemical, which was recently designated as a probable human carcinogen, serves no medicinal purpose. But even though this was detected in the vitamin tablets, Florida State Attorney was still hesitant to file charges as they believed they still had insufficient evidence to prosecute Judy. Detectives, however, were determined to find more proof that would change the minds of state attorneys. Less than a month after interviewing John Gentry, the 27th of July 1983, police would search the Gulf Breeze home of Judy Bueno Año. Inside, they retrieved wire and tape found in her bedroom, which appeared to resemble the car bomb used the month before. It would be confirmed to be a match later on. Furthermore, police would also find marijuana and a sawed-off shotgun in James Jr.'s room. He would be arrested and placed in jail for possession of drugs and an illegal weapon. That same day, while Judy was working at her beauty salon, police would swoop down onto the business, arresting her for the attempted murder of John Gentry. The investigation didn't just stop there, though. During this time, police were also attempting to track down the buyer of the dynamite which was used as part of the car bomb. By mid-August, they managed to successfully link the purchase back to none other than Judy herself, after identifying around a dozen long-distance phone calls from her home. While Judy was able to post bail for the attempted murder charge against John Gentry, suspicion then turned to the previous men in her life who had also perished. At the time of her son's death, there were also a further two life insurance policies which were held privately. At the time of Judy trying to claim these, it was suspected that the signature alleged to be Michael's had actually been forged. Handwriting experts all but confirmed this at the time, but Judy faced no repercussions until now. On the 11th of January 1984, Judy Buenoano would be charged with first-degree murder of her son Michael and an additional count of grand theft in relation to the insurance scam. It was said that at the time of her arrest that Judy went into a fit of convulsions, although it was likely she was faking it. Regardless, she spent time at Santa Rosa Hospital under police supervision. A month later, the 11th of February, the body of Bobby Joe Morris was exhumed and examined, where it was found that traces of arsenic were present in his body. James Goodyear Sr.'s body would also be exhumed the following month, the 14th of March, and to nobody's surprise by this point, arsenic was also found in his remains. A further charge of first-degree murder was placed on her with regards to her husband James Goodyear, and eight days after he was examined, the 22nd of March 1984, Judy would go on trial for the murder of her son, Michael. It would be at this trial where she would earn the Black Widow nickname commonly associated with her. Prosecutor Russell Edgar, who was the prosecutor in this case, asked the judge at the time to admit the other killings as evidence of her guilt. He would tell the judge, quote, When I was asking the judge in the drowning case to admit the other killings as evidence, I said, Judge, she's like a Black Widow. She feeds off her mates and her young. On the 31st of March 1984, Judy Buenoano would be found guilty of the murder of her son Michael and grand theft for the collection of insurance policies. She would be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole on the 6th of June 1984. That same month, police would exhume another of Judy's former lovers, Gerald Dossett, who had passed away in what was now similar circumstances back in 1980. When tests were carried out on his remains, arsenic was yet again found. However, no charges were brought against her in this instance. While researching this case, it appears as though there was some confusion over the outcome of the John Gentry trial. However, I believe I found the source of this confusion. While multiple sources claimed that Judy had been found not guilty for the attempted murder of her boyfriend at the time, this was not the case. It was actually her younger son, James Goodyear Jr., who was acquitted of the crime on the 10th of August, 1984. Judy would later stand trial on the 15th of October, just a little more than two months after her younger son, where she would be found guilty three days later 
and after just two hours of jury deliberation, she was handed a 12-year prison sentence to run consecutive to the life sentence earlier handed to her. A year later, the 22nd of October 1985, Judy would now stand trial for the murder of her husband, James Goodyear Sr. The trial would last 10 days, resulting in her being found guilty, and on the 26th of November, Judy would be sentenced to death by electric chair. Because of this sentence, the decision was made by Colorado authorities not to charge Judy with Bobby Morris's death, as they could later charge her should the death penalty be reduced to life or overturned in the future. Throughout each trial, Judy maintained her innocence, insisting that jurors were simply convinced by what she deemed as manufactured evidence. She would later say, quote, I have been the victim of defamation, assassination of character, to make me into a vile monster. I would have found myself guilty if I were the jury. Between 1986 and 1990, Judy would file multiple appeals, all of which would fail. Shortly before her execution, Judy would conduct a TV interview where she would continue to protest her innocence, saying, quote, I would like to clear for the record for my grandson. I would like for him to know that his grandmother was not a murderer. A last-ditch effort to have her death sentence overturned was also denied on the 29th of March 1998. As such, her death warrant was signed, leaving her destined to be electrocuted on a then 75-year-old electric chair built by inmates in 1923. Her last day was spent with her children, Kimberly and James, as well as other relatives and various religious and legal advisors. Her final meal consisted of broccoli, asparagus, strawberries and hot tea. At 7 o'clock in the morning, on the 30th of March, Judy was taken to the chair, where a gallery of observers gathered in wait. According to a prison spokesman at the time, he said, quote, She was very solemn. This is the first time I've seen that expression on her. She stared straight ahead, made no visible expression. After being strapped into the chair, she was asked if she had any last words. No, sir, was her response. She then closed her eyes to prevent her from looking at the witnesses present. At 7.13am on the 30th of March 1998, Judy Buenoano was pronounced dead at Florida State Prison at the age of 54. She had become the first woman to be executed in the state of Florida since 1848, and the first woman to be electrocuted in the United States since 1976. Judy just went one murder too far. These were the words of Pensacola detective Ted Chamberlain, who later went on to say, quote, If she just let that last boyfriend alone, she probably could have walked away from the other murders. And to be fair, had she not gone to such extremes to remove John Gentry, perhaps she would have. By the way, can we just take a moment to acknowledge John Gentry's resilience? What a survivor. Judy Buenoano was motivated by greed, pure and simple. While I acknowledge that her upbringing was a difficult one, it by no means excuses her actions in later life. Like the last video discussing Joe Metheny, Judy appears to have been a serial liar who managed to con and kill her way to a reported $240,000 in insurance payouts. But this was not enough for Judy, who by the end was undone by the very greed that motivated her. Thank you for watching, and a special thank you to those who support me via channel membership and through Patreon. Neil and Fur, The Alabastard, Mr. Gently Benevolent, Amanda, Krista, Omniblast, Shamu Smith, Angie Thompson, Holy Holy, and Rory Herbert. Members and Patreon subscribers receive early access to audio-only versions of my videos, as well as other exclusive content. If you're interested, check the link in the description. Until next time, take care, and goodbye. For now.